Historical Jesus, Part 14, Last Supper. I want to look at the betrayal of Judas Iscariot just a little bit, at least the early stages of that, and then get into the Last Supper when he actually pulled the trigger and went off and did, did what he did. Um, and set that in, in the context of Jesus and his instruction at the Last Supper. Like last, last time, this is a, a very uh, dense teaching period in the ministry of Jesus. Uh, the Olivet Discourse, if you look at it from Matthew, is Matthew 24 and 25, two full chapters, and they're long chapters. The uh, Last Supper contains quite a few chapters as well. John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, if you look at it from John. I mean, that's a huge chunk of the gospel. And so as with last time, I can't cover every verse. I mean, really the best way to do this is to go verse by verse and to really understand the whole thing. But that's just not going to happen in 30 minutes. It's not even going to happen in an hour. And I, I fear that at an hour and a half, I might be the only one still here. So we're just going to summarize some things and uh, take it from there. But I have for you here up on the screen, John chapter 12, where it talks about this incident that happened before the Last Supper. The Last Supper, at least in John, happens in chapter 13. So this is the chapter before that, chapter 12, verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave him a dinner there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of Jesus' disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And, you know, what's so, what's so shocking about Judas' statement here to me is how reasonable it is. It's so reasonable. Uh, this, this, this ointment is worth 300 denarii. A, denar a denarius is a day's wage. So this is 300 days wages. She, and what's she doing with it? She's just, she's just spending it all right then and there on his feet. You know, like what, what waste? What an extravagant waste. What are you doing? You know, like this could do so much good in the world. And you're just pouring it out. And so it's like, you know, when I, when I think about it like that, it's just so reasonable. And then on the other hand, he's, you know, interrupting this incredible tender act of godly devotion of this woman to Jesus. And like, who dares to do that, right? And so Jesus um, sticks up for, for her. But before he does that, we read this parenthetical comment that gives us a little bit more insight into the situation. That's from verse 6 here where it says, He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. And they were about to find out how quick his burial was to happen. And this incident here starts to show a little bit about Judas's character, right? We don't get a lot about Judas's character. We don't have a speech Judas makes like before he goes to do it, and he doesn't make a speech like, I was always misunderstood my whole life. Nobody ever listened to me, and now they listen to me, you see? We don't get any sort of like dramatic speech like that from Judas. We just get this incident here and then something extremely significant. We see, and it says it repeatedly in different of the Gospels, we see that Satan was involved. And it very clearly says it, that Satan was working with this man or that Satan entered into him or that Satan tempted him in this way. And so... You don't necessarily always get a logical explanation for things in life, right? 
especially when demons are involved, right? And so whatever Judas's original motivation was for this, it's not like Jesus had a life insurance policy and Judas was going to get rich if he died, okay? So the greed thing works to some degree, but it, there's still something else going on within his soul. And Satan was able to twist that into betraying Jesus, who never did him wrong. And that's what ended up happening. And so what ended up happening was Jesus or Judas went off to the chief priests and he said to them, how much do you give me for Jesus if I turn him into you? Now, if you remember the chief priests, they really wanted Jesus. They wanted to get him off the street because what was Jesus doing? He, he entered Jerusalem in a prophetic fulfillment of Zechariah on a donkey as if he is the Messiah. He caused this huge disturbance in the temple and then... He made, he made fools of everyone that tried to stump him with their questions. And then, even if all that wasn't bad enough, he pronounced all these woes on them, saying that they were hypocrites and the people were hanging on his words. And so they really want to get Jesus. They want to get him out of the public eye. They don't want him to cause a riot. They don't want an incident with the authorities, right? But they can't do it because if they go to get Jesus, they're going to get stoned. People love them. You know, here's somebody that Jesus just healed their cousin, and now you're going to arrest Jesus? I don't think so. He's going to get involved, right? And so what ends up happening is Judas says to them, I will tell you where he's going to be and when he's going to be there. And they gave him 30 pieces of silver, and he came back. And so now he's an undercover agent of the priests to find out what, where Jesus is going and report it back to them. And that's the setting for the Last Supper. And we read about the Last Supper in all the Gospels, right? And I'm going to stick mostly with John because the Gospel of John has the most detail, okay? But I want to start in Luke because Luke talks about this, uh, what we call the communion or the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, this incident where you have the bread and the wine, right? So I'm going to start here in verse 17. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, so they're sitting down to a meal together, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And so the bread and the wine, these are normal items at the dinner table. There's nothing unusual about them. What's unusual is what Jesus does with them. And you have to keep in mind, Jesus has not yet died. All right? So... He's, he's explaining to them something that signifies what's about to happen, and they don't understand it yet. There's actually a scripture where it says that he explained to them that he was going to die and that God was going to raise him from the dead. And then the scripture says, and they did not understand these things, and they were hidden from them. So look, if you don't understand it, you don't understand it. But they did it. You know what I mean? They had the bread, they had the wine, and Jesus says, this bread is my body, and this, this uh, cup is the new covenant in my blood. These are, these are concepts that are going to get much more elaboration later on as God helps people to understand what this all meant. But the first time, they're just blessed to participate in it and don't really understand what's going on, and then Jesus goes right into someone's going to betray me. And I'm sure that made the dinner a little intense, especially for Judas, who was sitting right there. Verse 21, But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is on the table, for the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. And a dispute arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded the greatest. Isn't that something? So they, they, Jesus says to them, one of you is going to betray me. 
And so that's a question of which is the worst disciple, right? Because only the worst disciple would actually betray Jesus. And somehow that flips into a conversation, well, then who's the best disciple? And they argue with each other. They actually argue with each other. Jesus is trying to have the first communion, and they're arguing about who's the worst disciple and who's the best disciple. And you can just see him like, oh, well, you know, he, he, I, was, I was following him before you. And then, you know, one of them says, yeah, but I've been writing down all these sayings as he goes, so I'm pretty much the best. Or this one over here says, well, you know, I'm Peter, so I basically win. You know what I mean? And then John's like, well, I'm the one he loves or whatever. You know, and they, you can just imagine how ridiculous it must have sounded to Jesus. But they're serious. They're seriously arguing about this. And so Jesus deals with that. And what he does is he talks to them about how the Gentiles lord it over each other. It says, he says in verse 25, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For who is greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. So Jesus turns the whole idea of power on its head by saying power is not expressed properly in the eyes of God. It's not expressed from the top down where someone dominates other people and makes them do things they want them to do. That's how the Gentiles, that's how the pagans do it. That's how the unbelievers do it, right? Jesus says, no, 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 no. The proper way to have power and to exercise power and lordship is to come under others and lift them up. To, to come under them and to serve them. And then he gives them the best example of what that means physically by washing their feet. And that's where we flip over to John chapter 13, where we see Jesus disrobing, taking off his clothes, wrapping a towel around himself, which again, that would have been... That would have been a little unusual for, I mean, even, I mean, for your dinner, right? If, if your dinner guest stripped down to their underwear and then put a towel on and started washing, you know, people's feet, that would be weird, right? I mean, it would really get your attention. How much more so in an honor-shame society where you have this very clear rabbi-disciples relationship He's the rabbi, we do what he says, absolute commitment to him, all this other stuff we've talked about in the past, and now he's, he's half naked in a towel wiping my feet. What is going on here? I mean, it would have been, however awkward it would be for us, it would be twice as awkward for them. Um, and that's what he did. And he gets to Peter, and of course, what does Peter say? Not me, Lord. Not me, Lord. You're not touching these puppies. There's no way I'm letting you wash my feet. And then Jesus says to him, if I don't wash your feet, then you're, you're not, you have no part in me. And then Peter famously says, well, they're not my feet, but also my hands and my head. So just watch, give me a shower, Jesus. <laughs> Throw me in the bucket, you know. It's just so funny. And then Jesus is like, all right, settle down, Peter. He said, well, he doesn't say settle down, but he says, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but it is completely clean. You see that there? Jesus is like, just the feet, man. Right. And you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him, and that was why he said, not all of you are clean. So he, he goes through. I mean, we're talking about, we have 12 of these disciples, right? At least, there could have been more, but at least 12, right? And, I mean, how long does it take to wash a foot? You know, it takes a little bit of time, not like a long time, but it takes, and then you're going to do one after the other after the other, you're going to wipe them off with the towel. It takes some serious time, right? I mean, th this is time. These guys have just had an argument about who's the greatest, right? And so Jesus is like, all right, we're going to, we're going to show how this all works. And then he doesn't leave it up to interpretation. He explains what he means as well. And I'm glad he did. He says to them, uh, verse 12, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? 
You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. So Jesus is not in denial here, right? He's like, look, you call me teacher, you call me Lord, and you're right, for so I am. Then he says, then he uses it to his advantage. He says, if I then, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. And that's the genius of Jesus teaching is that he shows them how to do it. And then he says, do like I have done to you. And this is a, 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 we, we live in a world where the Good Samaritan is a cliche people know about. And washing the feet is uh, something people they, they didn't exist yet for them. This was fresh. This was new. And, and it was a revolution in thinking about how to treat people that I'm sure was very surprising and at the same time exciting for them to hear about. Verse 16, Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. And then he goes back into the one who was to betray him once again. Um, right here in verse 21, his spirit gets troubled. And we have this whole scene where he says, one of you is going to betray me. And the disciples look at each other. You see that there? The disciples looked at one another. <laughs> it's like, all right. No, it's not going to be you. I could see you doing it. Uh, I don't know about that one. You know, and they're look is that something? They're looking at each other. Their feet are still wet a little bit, right? And they're looking at each other like, uh, I think it's this one over here. And um, they, they really want to know. And so the disciple whom Jesus loved was reclining, and Peter gets his attention. Hey, hey, ask him who it is. <laughs> so immature, right? Like right at the dinner table. And so he does, and Jesus answered, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. You see that there? Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. Now, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money back, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. And so that's what ends up happening with Judas. Jesus signals. Now, they don't know when he's going to betray him, and they don't know exactly what betrayal means. The only one who knows, the only one who's feeling super uncomfortable I mean, I'm sure they're all uncomfortable to a certain degree, but super uncomfortable is Judas because he's already made the deal. He's got the money stashed away somewhere or else in his pocket that they already paid him, right? And this is it. He gets this. Satan enters into him. He leaves the room immediately. And now, from everything we've seen throughout this last week of his life, this is the last piece that needs to lock into motion to get the wheels of injustice rolling that climax with his crucifixion. And that's what ends up happening is he goes out and he tells them where Jesus is going to be. Jesus does not leave the room. Jesus does not alter the plan. As we'll see next week, Jesus does not run away. He goes to the place that he knows he normally goes to, and that Judas knows he normally goes to, the Garden of Gethsemane, and he stays there, and he prays, and it's a struggle, and he sweats, and it's like as drops of blood, but he sticks to the plan. And that's what Jesus does. Now, in verse 31 here, it seems like Jesus has a moment of relief. This part of the plan is done. You know, what needed to happen here is done. And he says, and it's, it's an interesting uh, way of saying it, so I want to explain it to you. Verse 31, when he had gone out, Jesus said, when Judas had gone out, Jesus has said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. What? Because this guy went out to betray you, now you're glorified? 
If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. And so this whole glorification business, what is Jesus talking about here? And I found this little statement by F.F. F. Bruce uh, some years back, and it's always, I felt, been very helpful to me in understanding how the word glory and the, the idea of glorification works in the Gospel of John. Typically, the way glorification works is it's related to his exaltation, his ascension, his resurrection, those kinds of events, right? Not in the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, it includes everything that leads up to that. And this is what F.F. F. Bruce says. The Son, of Man, the Son of Man's suffering becomes the first stage in his receiving of glory and can indeed be spoken of absolutely as his being glorified. If Judas's mind has been made up, the Lord's mind has also been made up. He has accepted the suffering and death which lie ahead, and therefore he can refer to the passion or suffering as the glory in the past tense. They are as good as accomplished. The Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. I find that so helpful because what Jesus, Jesus, his, his side of the arrangement is to follow what God directs him to do, to follow the plan that God has laid out for him, which culminates, we know, in his crucifixion, right? That's what Jesus has to do. When he's dead, he can't do anything anymore. It's already done. He's waiting on the Father to bring him out of the grave, right? And that's resurrection. And then, when it comes to ascension, Jesus can't, do, it's not like he can just jump really high or something. God has to ascend him Bring him up, raise him into heaven. So uh, once, once we get to the crucifixion moment and he stays on that cross, his work is done. That glorification, all that down the line is as good as done because Jesus' end is done. God's going to lock in and fulfill everything that he's promised because Jesus has stayed true until his last breath. And, so G and Jesus knows that. Judas is just laughing. He's like... Glorification, man. Glorification. We got this. You know? And I think that's a, a really helpful way of, of looking at this. And so then Jesus goes on to teach. What's he going to do? He's a rabbi. Remember that? He's, it's not like that one time we looked at him being a rabbi. He stopped being a rabbi after that. He's always a rabbi. He's always a miracle worker. He's always a kingdom preacher. He's always doing all the different things we've seen in this class together. And so what does he do? He teaches them. He's not going to see them again. For, you know, I mean, he's going to spend a little bit of time with them, but this is his real last opportunity to teach them, and teach them he does. Chapter after chapter after chapter. And then in chapter 17, we get this long prayer, the longest prayer of Jesus, John chapter 17. The, the best moment we ever see of what it sounds like when Jesus prays to his Father. The whole chapter. Right, And then, at the end of that, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. So, obviously, I'm not going to be able to read every verse here. I've got about six minutes left here, six and a half minutes left. So, I'm just going to hit some bullet points of summary, and hopefully these will interest you, and you will go back to John and read this on your own and expand your understanding of what Jesus taught at his Last Supper. Okay? So, he begins... At the end of chapter 13 here, with a new commandment. And he says to them, I give you a new commandment. The old commandment was to love your neighbor as what? Yourself. yourself. Here's the new commandment. That they must love others as Jesus loved them. Because Jesus didn't just love the neighbor as, as himself. Jesus did all kinds of going beyond that. And so he's saying, you need to do it the way I did it to you. By this, by this, how you love people. All will know that you are a true follower, that you are a disciple. That's what Jesus says indicates his true followers from the fakers. If we love as he loved us. So that's a really important one there, huh? And then he goes on in chapter 14 to talk about the only way to the Father. He's going away. He's coming back again to receive them to himself, to be with them. And they say, well, where are you going? And he's, and he's like, you know the way. And they're like, we don't know the way. And he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you get a lot of those kinds of figurative statements 
in this upper room discourse. And actually he says at the end of it, in chapter 16, he says, these things I've spoken to you in figurative language. And they're like, no, Jesus, we understand everything. You know, it's no big deal. Uh, but he knows that they don't. But the Spirit is coming. And we'll, we'll get to that in just a second to help them remember. Then the next thing he talks about is seeing Jesus is seeing the Father. He, Jesus, Because Jesus does the works of God and speaks his words, they should believe that he is in the Father and the Father is in him. And I don't know if you have read this before, but it's this moment at the dinner, or probably after dinner where they're sitting around. Philip says to him, show us the Father. And then Jesus says, have I been so long with you and you haven't seen me? Don't you realize that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? You should believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And the words that I speak are the words... This is something we've talked about before, so I won't belabor it. But it's a key part of this uh, time here. That when you see Jesus, what you're seeing is not Him, but through Him to the one that's in Him that is revealing all these things. Um, and then he talks about the Helper, the Paraklitos, or... in uh, an old English word, paraclete, uh, not parakeet, that's a bird, I think. But paraclete is uh, an advocate, a helper, uh, old translation might say comforter, right? But this is talking about the Spirit. Jesus is leaving, and this is all about preparing them for when he's gone. So he says they're not going to be orphaned because the Spirit, through the Spirit, the Father and his Son are going to make their home with them. And this, I'm sure to them, must have been like, what is he talking about now? But it makes perfect sense once you get through, you know, the whole events that follow after this. You get to Pentecost, the outpouring of the Spirit, that Christ is able to be with his people through the Spirit, as well as the Father. The Father was already with his people through the Spirit, but now Christ is going to be with them as well. The vine illustration in chapter 15, Jesus says, that he's the vine, we're the branches. If we abide in him, we will bear much fruit. And he talks about the key to that fruit is being obedience. And then the one command he really wants us to obey is that we love each other. And if we love each other, then we'll obey him. And if we obey him, then we'll love each other. And then he goes on from there to talk about how, yeah, there might be all this love with him, but the world is going to hate you. <laughs> and the world's going to persecute them just like they persecuted Jesus. But he's still got to go. He's got to go. He cannot stay. It's to their advantage that he goes, because if he doesn't go, then the helper, the Spirit, is not going to come and convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And then he goes on to teach more about the Holy Spirit. He talks about the Spirit of truth will guide them in chapter 16, verses 12 to 15. Jesus cannot say everything now. It seems like he says a lot. <laughs> right? He's got all these chapters, right? But he, even in the midst of all that, he's like, guys, I just, I just can't tell you everything right now. But the Spirit, when it comes, will relay the truth from Jesus. And they're going to have sorrow when, when, when this whole thing happens, right? Verse 16 to 22. They're going to have sorrow. After a little while, they won't see him anymore and experience sorrow. But when they see him again, they will rejoice. And so Jesus knows the plan. He's trying to explain it to them. It's not sinking in. But he's like, look, it's going it's to be really painful, but this can going to be really good. He's trying to help them get through the bad part, right? Because there is going to be this bad part where they don't know what's, which way is up, Right? And they can hang, uh, cling to his words. And then uh, later on in chapter 16, they, he talks about prayer. He says, look, you need to ask in my name to receive. And that they will ask the Father in his name since he is now leaving the world and going to the Father. Before that, like in the, the Lord's Prayer, he just said, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, right? It doesn't say in the name of Jesus at the end of that. He says, look, you haven't been doing this up until now, but now that I'm going, I want you to ask in my name. And then he talks about how they're going to scatter at the end of the discourse here. They may scatter, but they should take heart. An hour is coming when they will all leave him. Jesus knows they're going to ditch him. But Jesus has said everything ahead of time so that they can have peace and take heart. After all, he has overcome the world. And so Jesus is preparing them in this time. And then what he does before his disciples in this last moment is he looks up into heaven and he prays. And he has this awesome prayer where 
he talks about this glorification again. You know, back to, let me pull it up here. We skipped through a lot of this. We'll just kind of cruise a little bit there. Okay. He lifted his eyes up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And he says, I have glorified you on the earth. I have accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And he goes on from there and he talks about how he's revealed himself to the disciples and how they believed in him. And, and then he starts praying for his disciples. He says, keep them from the, from the evil one. Don't take them out of the world. I'm leaving, but don't take them out. Keep them. Protect them. And Jesus prays for his disciples. And it's awesome. And you should read it. And then he prays for you. He prays for me. I've got to get to this verse here. There it is. It starts there in verse uh, 20. I can mark it right here. This is all a long prayer here. Jesus says, I do not ask for these only, not the, just the people in the room, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's you. That's me. That they may all be one. What did Jesus pray for us? If Jesus could pray one thing for us, what would it be? That we may all be one. That's what he wants for his people. That they would get along, that they would have unity, that they wouldn't fight. And what do we have? 33,000 denominations. Yeah. Doesn't really make me feel that good, but he still <laughs> wants unity. We need to be unifiers, don't we? Just as you, Father, are in me, this is the unity he wants for his people, his church. Just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that you may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. He thinks that if we could just, just even locally, right here, experience unity. I know we come from different backgrounds, right? We have different perspectives, different life experiences, right? But if we could be one, right? If I could be one with you, if you could be one with each other, then... The world would see that and the world would be like, you know what, that's, that's weird, but it's beautiful. You know, and that they would actually believe that the Father sent the Son. You see how that works? That's what he prays for. And then he says, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. That's what we call repetition. I and them, you and me, that they may be perfect, become perfectly one. That's repetition again. Um, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you love me. And so that's what Jesus wants for his church. I don't think it's changed from that day to today. And I think we all have a little part to play in that, uh, to, to fight for unity and to, to love each other. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask that you would guide us. We thank you for your spirit. We ask that you help us to take courage from our perspective, having already seen what happens after the Last Supper, for having seen how your Son stays faithful and true until the end against impossible situations and pain and suffering, and that you did vindicate him. You brought him through it, as we'll see next week, and you glorified him in such a way that he is seated at your right hand today. We pray that you help us to be one so that the world would believe that you sent him. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.